We had a general introduction to Hume's Of Miracles last time, and we explored the question of whether Hume, in the first part of this famous essay, is actually putting forward an argument or merely setting up the terms of the discussion. I made the case that he is actually putting forward an argument today. We will look at how Hume and Hume's contemporaries engaged with those issues and how they evaluated what they certainly took to be his argument in part one. Brief recap. Hume was born in 1711, died in 1776, uh, probably wrote his essay of miracles as a young man in the 1730s, certainly thought it out, but did not publish it until later. He mentions in a letter to a friend that he deliberately left some things out of his treatise of human nature to avoid giving offense, and certainly when this one was published, it gave offense. Um, because of some criticisms that he received of it, from the 1748 edition, he altered some expressions and phrases and added some material in the 1768 edition. It's useful to have both of those in view as one is thinking about this, so I believe in the library we have both the first edition and a subsequent edition that has some of these alterations in it. That can help sometimes if you're trying to understand why a particular critic says a particular thing that you don't find in the text. It may have been in the text of an earlier version. Hume begins by talking about an argument from the writings of Dr. Tillotson. So it's important that we get just a little bit of a handle on that. John Tillotson was an Anglican bishop. He was Dean of Canterbury and later, at the end of his life, became Archbishop of Canterbury, I believe just for the last three years of his life or so. He was what would be called a broad churchman, latitudinarian in the older sense of the word. That is, he favored Protestant unity he even got together with people like Richard Baxter, trying to see if they could find enough common ground to unite as a bulwark against Roman Catholicism. That, of course, we covered in the historical portion of the course, where we saw some of the uh, reasons for this long-standing distrust of Roman Catholicism. Some of them had some merit. Some of them were wholly fabricated, like Titus Oakes's accusations. But whether good or bad, they were influential reasons, and they affected these people at this time. Uh, Tillotson was quite an anti-Catholic polemicist, not only writing against various Catholic authors who were attacking Protestantism, but also uh, recurring to the critique of the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. This is a doctrine about what happens in the Eucharist when the bread and the wine are blessed. And so let's just get a grip on what the official Catholic position is from the Council of Trent before we dive into Tillotson's argument and Hume's use of a what he calls a similar form of argument. Transubstantiation is technically the change whereby, according to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the bread and the wine used in the sacrament of the Eucharist become not merely as by a sign or a figure, but also in actual reality, the body and blood of Christ. Now, they're becoming this in actual reality requires some understanding of the sense in which they become this in actual reality. The Catholic Church teaches that it is the substance or reality of the bread that is changed into that of the body of Christ, and similarly for the wine, while at the same time the species or the accidents, the things that are accessible to the senses, are unchanged. Everything that you can access with your senses, the smell, the taste, the chemical composition, remains as it was. This is a concept that is possible within a certain sort of metaphysical framework. So if you have, for example, a broadly Aristotelian framework of substance and accident, then you can accommodate this kind of a view. Um, Tillotson is completely contemptuous of this. So since Hume says in Dr. Tillotson's writings, let's examine one example. There are several, but just one example of how Tillotson mounts his case. Here's what he said says, had they, he means the apostles, preached transubstantiation and the renouncing of our senses in order to the belief of it, miracles could have given no credit to it. For that which depends upon the certainty of sense, as miracles do, cannot be a competent argument to prove that which is contrary to sense. For that which makes me sure of the miracle, which should prove this doctrine, does at the same time make me equally sure that this doctrine is not true. Who are you going to believe? The long arguments of your priest or your own lying eyes? 
That's the dilemma that he wants to put us to. If there were no other evidence that transubstantiation is no part of the Christian doctrine, this, to a wise man, would be sufficient. That what proves the one overthrows the other, and that miracles, which are certainly the best and highest external proof of Christianity, are the worst proof in the world of transubstantiation unless a man can renounce his senses at the same time that he relies upon them. For a man cannot believe a miracle without relying upon his senses, nor transubstantiation without renouncing them, and never were any two things so ill-coupled together as the doctrine of Christianity and that of transubstantiation, because they draw several ways, that is, they pull in opposite directions, and are ready to strangle one another. The main evidence and confirmation of the Christian doctrine, which is miracles, is resolved into the certainty and testimony of the senses, but this evidence is clear and point-blank against transubstantiation. So there is one example from Sermon 198 in his uh, collected works of his framing of the argument against transubstantiation. It contradicts your senses. At best, an argument from miracles would appeal to your senses, but this contradicts it in the most evident possible way. Therefore, we cannot believe it. No, not even if it were defended by miracles. So how do we get from Tillotson to Hume? Well, First thing to note is that Tillotson's statement of the argument rests upon what looks like a misstatement of the Roman Catholic position. Um, he appeals to the evidence of your senses, but of course, the standard Catholic position is that to your senses, all of the properties of the bread will seem to remain properties of bread and the properties of wine, properties of wine, not of blood. He is aware of this distinction. He discusses it in one of his works. But he believes that it's improperly applied in cases of this kind. Why? Well, one of the accidental properties in Aristotelian metaphysics is extension in space. And if all of the accidental properties remain the same, then what becomes of the body of Christ? It really is still the body of Christ, what accidental properties does it now have? Well, it's being multiplied every time a priest blesses the Eucharist. It's being multiplied and spread out. Its extension is changing. That, he thinks, is crazy. Hume's critique, which is what really interests us here, picks up on the opposition between direct evidence of our senses and any indirect evidence that comes to us ultimately through our senses, say, hearing or reading the testimony of purported eyewitnesses. So he wants to use this opposition to make his argument work. That's the hinge of it for him. So whether Tillotson's argument is good or bad, fair or unfair, Hume wants to pick up on that use of the direct evidence of the senses and some indirect evidence that ultimately bottoms out in our senses and say the direct is superior to the indirect. What's his definition of a miracle? Well, here he gives one. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. Hume also elsewhere gives another definition that speaks of a violation of the course of nature by the interposition of a deity, by a god's intervening. And you'll notice that this definition, which is the more famous one, makes no mention of God at all. So there is a little bit of a debate over even the proper way of taking Hume, should we take it, that he means both of these? Does he mean one of them to be fundamental and the other just to be a sort of an obvious, plausible corollary of it? That's all an interesting dispute. Notice, however, the terminology. He's very big on speaking of laws of nature and opposing this is the terminology we find in Sherlock and others of the usual course. It's not the usual course of nature that he wants to refer to, it's laws. Now Hume is writing at a time where the work of Isaac Newton is the pinnacle of scientific achievement and Newton has found laws. Newton has, for example, the law of action and reaction. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. If you and I are standing on roller skates facing one another and I shove you you will move one direction, but I will move the other direction. So Newton has found laws like this, and using such laws, 
Newton has solved many of the central problems of dynamics, uh, even applying these to the heavenly bodies. So the laws of nature, that's a phrase that has a lot of cultural value with the audience to whom Hume is writing, and it's not an accident that he chooses to phrase this in terms of firm and unalterable experience that has established laws. Well, what's the evidence against a miracle? Here's how Hume lays it out. By the way, you'll notice I have these little bracketed numbers, 10.12, you see at the bottom of this quotation. Um, 10 refers to section 10 of Hume's Philosophical Essays. I've numbered the paragraphs. Uh, there are 41 paragraphs in Hume's uh, Essay of Miracles. The first 13 are in part 1, and then starting with 14 and going on through 41 we have the paragraphs of part two. So I'll be referring to them paragraph by paragraph in case you're using various editions. That's one way that you can track it down and find what I'm talking about. Here's what Hume says in paragraph 12. It is no miracle that a man seemingly in good health should die on a sudden, because such a kind of death, though more unusual than any other, has yet been frequently observed to happen. But it is a miracle that a dead man should come to life, because that has never been observed in any age or country. There must therefore be a uniform experience against every miraculous event, otherwise the event would not merit that appellation. Now, that way of putting the opposition attracted notice from some of Hume's critics. The first thing that they noted, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, is that the fact that dead men stay dead is a widely observed fact, but it's not in the scientific sense of the word a law of nature that dead men stay dead. Laws of nature involve, uh, say, universal gravitation or equal and opposite reaction, but laws of nature in that sense are very fundamental level things, and the higher order phenomena like dead people staying dead which we are all well aware is the ordinary course of nature, don't quite qualify as laws. Second, uh, this argument says that miracles are by definition opposed by the greatest possible evidence. Hume's critics are not going to accept that. They are going to say that events that seem quite improbable may, given the evidence, be the most credible, the most likely, uh, we may be in a position to say that what appeared incredible is, after the evidence comes in, quite credible. You rem may remember that I had some references to Robert Boyle's position on miracles. This is exactly the position that Boyle takes both in his unpublished letter on Spinoza and in his work, uh, The Christian Virtuoso. So Hume's critics are harking back to the tradition of Robert Boyle as they say these kinds of things against him. Let's think a bit more about this definition, though. If by laws he means summary statements of what always happens, then it looks like he's begging the question. After all, if miracles are violations of the laws of nature, and if violations of those laws never happen, then miracles never happen. That would be a very quick argument against the miraculous, and it's an argument that a few people have tried to endorse. McKinnon, uh, most famously in the mid-20th century, tried to endorse this argument. But it is pretty widely dismissed, and I think rightly dismissed, as a begging of the question. So if that's what he means, then we have a problem with the structure of his argument. Well, what if he means summary statements of what has always happened in the past? That would be weaker, right? Not just saying it can't happen. It's a violation of what always happens. But just saying, well, so far and in the past, we've never seen it. Well, then he's going to run into two problems. First of all, one of the earlier parts of his philosophical essays, at, I believe it's uh, section four, is an attack on inductive inference, the kind of inference we use to extrapolate from our limited experience to things beyond our experience, and in particular, to extrapolate from the past to the future. Hume is the paradigmatic critic of inductive inference. And if his argument against miracles relies crucially on an induction, Hume has just cut his own legs out from under himself. His argument in the two different sections of his philosophical essays
will refute itself. That is probably not a position that he wanted, and that may be a further piece of evidence that Hume's essay of miracles was written at an earlier time when perhaps his doubts about induction had not yet suggested themselves to him, and perhaps he did not even see the trouble putting the pieces of his own position together that way. Second, his Christian adversaries will again claim that even this more modest statement is question-begging. They'll refer to the resurrection of Lazarus, the son of the widow of Nain, Jairus' daughter, and so forth, and say, you, we just aren't going to grant that these things have never happened in the past. They're rare, but they have occurred. Now, Hume might not care. He might say, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm trying to argue for the benefit of the wise and the reasonable, who already agree with me that none of those things happened, and now I'm giving them a weapon to argue that nothing of the like ever will happen either. Hume's terminology is very interesting, and it's important that we look at it closely in order to understand fully where he's going. Here's another quotation. This is from the eighth paragraph in part one of section 10. When the fact attested is such a one as has seldom fallen under our observation, here is a contest of two opposite experiences. You can see the influence of Tillotson's kind of argument on Hume right here, of which the one destroys the other as far as its force goes, and the superior can only operate on the mind by the force which remains. So, if it's the sort of fact that's seldom fallen under our observation, and we have testimony for it, then we have to sort of set up an arm wrestling match between the testimony and the rareness of the event, and one or the other of those will win the evidential arm wrestling match, although somewhat weakened by the force of the evidence opposing it. Focus on that phrase, a contest of two opposite experiences. With regard to a miracle claim, and so as not to lose ourselves in too wide a field, let's take the one that was central in the Deist controversy, the resurrection of Jesus. What is the experience that opposes the testimony? We know what the testimony is, more or less. What is the experience that opposes it? Is it my experience in 2015 that I walked around a graveyard the other day and nobody came out of the graves? Is that the experience that opposes the testimony? Hume wraps up part one with a flourish, with a famous maxim, and then he glosses it. So here's that quotation. The plain consequence is, and it is a general maxim worthy of our attention, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case, there is a mutual destruction of arguments, and the superior only gives us an assurance suitable to that degree of force which remains after deducting the inferior. So you see again here the arm wrestling concept. But also, he says, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless its falsehood would be more miraculous. I take it, and most of Hume's early readers took it, that by more miraculous he means less probable, more improbable. We want to believe whatever is more probable, given our total evidence, so we will reject what is less probable. The testimony would have to be such that its falsehood is even less probable than the occurrence of the miracle. There's hot debate over the proper way to formalize this. If this were a technical class rather than a historical one, I would take you through some of those formulations. You can get a quick look at that in my Stanford Encyclopedia article on miracles. Hume goes on, when anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he relates, should really have happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, or, as I'm taking him, the one improbability against the other. And according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision and always reject the greater miracle, that is, reject the thing which is most improbable in favor of the alternative. We'll come back to this maxim some on Wednesday.
um, because it intersects with some of the things that he does in part two in an interesting way. Let's see if we can give a reconstruction of Hume's argument. One can get into great detail here. I'm going to try to remain as simple and as close to the text as I can. First of all, the argument against a miracle from the nature of the case, because of the way that we define a miracle, is as strong as any argument from experience could possibly be. Premise two, the argument for a miracle from testimony is, at best, a strong but somewhat weaker argument from experience. In part two, he'll argue it's not even at its best in the cases that we actually have. But even at best, it would be somewhat weaker. It's hard to be any stronger than an argument that is as strong as any argument from experience can possibly be. Premise three, in any case where two arguments from experience point to contradictory conclusions, the stronger argument must prevail. Premise four, a conclusion is credible only if the argument supporting it is not overcome by a stronger argument for a contradictory conclusion. Therefore, the argument for a miracle from testimony cannot, even under the most favorable circumstances, render belief in a miracle credible. I think that this is not an unreasonable attempt to fill out what Hume is saying. One can get a little fancier and, and go into a little more detail, but I think that this is a pretty good uh, approximation of it. And it has the advantage that we're able to look specifically at premises in this argument and see that Hume's own contemporaries thought that this was how he was arguing, and they attacked premises in this argument. So let's look at premise number one. The argument against a miracle from the nature of the case is as strong as any argument from experience could possibly be. We can make a good textual case that this is one of Hume's claims. What did Hume's contemporaries think about that claim? about the argument from the nature of the case against a miracle. Not from evidence now, just a priori. Well, Richard Price in his fourth dissertation says, a miracle is more properly an event different from experience than contrary to it. This terse distinction is one that he works out in more detail, but so do other writers like Adams, for example, in his essay in answer to Mr. Hume's essay on miracles. Here's a quotation from Adams. Here the author seems to suppose that a want of experience in any case, a lack is what he means by a want, the absence of experience, is the same with experiencing the contrary. When a fact attested hath seldom fallen under our observation, quote, here is, says he, a contest of two opposite experiences. But in reality, here is no experience at all, only a fact not observed on one side, and positive evidence, or the fact attested on the other, a very unequal contest. What are Price and Adams getting at here? Their point is that it is not a contrary experience or an opposite experience for me to say, well, I've hung around graveyards and been to a few funerals and no one has ever sat up and walked away who was dead. That is something that's different from what's being claimed. But it will only be, only be contrary if I were, in fact, sitting in front of the tomb where Jesus was buried on the morning of the third day and saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I saw the body go in. The stone is still in place. You people who are wandering around saying the body is gone, what do you mean? Here, let's roll back the stone. See there, there's the dead body sitting right there. It's starting to smell. That would be contrary experience. But what we actually have is no experience with respect to the specific matter of fact in question. Merely a general sort of experience which Hume needs to extrapolate. So, it would be contrary to experience only if eyewitnesses denied that this particular event happened, and it would be contrary to my experience only if I were myself one of those eyewitnesses. Here's Adams again. Let him, if he pleases, plead his own experience, that he has never seen or been witness to any miracle, that he has always found the course of nature to be the same and unchanged. But does this experience teach him that the laws of nature are necessary and immutable? that there is no power in being sufficient to suspend or alter them, or that there can be no reasons to induce such a power to act? How could experience 
particularly Hume's own personal limited experience, possibly teach him that. The conclusion so far outstrips the evidence that it becomes unreasonable to plead his personal experience. Now, a defender of Hume might reply, it's not just my personal experience I'm pleading, but very widespread experience of many men in many countries. At this point, however, Campbell and Adams and other critics will turn the argument around on him and say, what, you're appealing to testimony in order to undermine testimony? Isn't there something inconsistent in your handling of this argument? If you need, absolutely need, in order to make your evidential base as wide as possible, to appeal to testimony, and the conclusion of your argument will be that testimony should be set aside. That had better be a pretty good trick. More criticisms of that first premise that in the nature of the case, miracles are always opposed by a maximally strong case. Here's something that Adams says that I think is relevant and intersects with something we saw in Sherlock. An experienced uniformity in the course of nature hath always been thought necessary to the belief and use of miracles. These are indeed relative ideas. There must be an ordinary regular course of nature before there can be anything extraordinary. A river must flow before its stream can be interrupted. What is Adam's point? Hume points to, and this is all he can point to, the widespread non-rising from the dead of dead bodies, the widespread non-resurrection of dead men. But Adam says everyone who has defended the existence of miracles has always thought that a stable background is necessary for the miracle to stand out as something exceptional. Do you remember what I called Sherlock's theorem from the trial of the witnesses? Apply it here. If the existence of widespread uniformity in the course of nature is assumed to be the case by the believer in miracles, then that fact cannot count as evidence against the claim that miracles do in fact happen. When a hypothesis entails a certain fact F, F cannot be used as evidence against the hypothesis. The hypothesis could fail for other reasons, but that cannot be used against it. So here Adams is saying the very evidence you're trying to point to is what the defenders of miracles, at least the defenders of miracles that he's talking about, would point to as an inevitable corollary of the existence of a miracle. Miracles couldn't fulfill their role unless there were an established course of nature. So the fact of widespread uniformity of nature and the non-resurrection of almost all dead people does not in the slightest count as evidence against miracles. Well, what about premise two? Let's review. Premise two was the claim that the argument for a miracle from testimony is, at best, a strong but somewhat weaker argument from experience. This also comes in for some heavy critique by Hume's opponents. Here's Adams on page 37. That men should love falsehood rather than truth, that they should choose labor and travail, shame and misery before pleasure, ease and esteem, is as much a violation of the laws of nature as it is for lead or iron to hang unsupported in the air, or for the voice of a man to raise the dead to life. The voice, mind you, just the voice. But this, I have granted to the author, is not miraculous, but impossible, and shall therefore have his leave, I hope, to assert that falsehood thus attested is impossible. In other words, that testimony thus tried and proved is infallible and certain. Notice what he's doing. He's going to turn Hume's argument around on him and say, there's a uniform course of experience with respect to what motivates men to do and say the things they do and say. And that uniform course of nature is that they don't do this for things they know to be false without intending to gain something. Pleasure, ease, prestige, money, power. But none of those things were obtained or could even plausibly have been hoped to be obtained by the first witnesses to the resurrection. And Adams then brings in a principle, which he quotes, we cannot make use of a more convincing argument than to prove that the actions ascribed to any person 
are directly contrary to the course of nature and that no human motives in such circumstances could ever induce him to such a conduct. This is a particularly shrewd blow because Adams is quoting Hume from a previous essay in this same volume. If Hume's position is that people for no reason and in the face of all possible human reasons made up a story for the purpose of getting themselves persecuted and perhaps killed in some exceedingly unpleasant way, then why by the principle that Hume himself has stated is maximally convincing, that didn't happen. Now, there's a limitation in Adam's critique. All that this shows is the sincerity of the witness. He might still be a dupe. He might be sincerely deceived. Adams, however, has already dealt with that question a few pages earlier. He argues that the nature of the facts in question, remember Sherlock's phrase, these are manifestly objects of sense, right? A man dead and a man alive are objects of sense, makes it impossible that the witnesses should be deceived. So the only option left is that they were deceivers, and that won't fly for the very kind of reason that Hume himself, writing elsewhere, has articulated. So Adams uses Hume against Hume. Adams also has a very shrewd observation on the question of method. As to the question of fact, he says, whether any such interpositions of divine power to work a miracle have been ever known or observed, this must be tried like all other historical facts by the testimony of those who relate it and the credit of the first witnesses who have vouched for it, and not, as this author would have it, by the testimony of others, of those who lived in distant times and places. So if the question is the resurrection of Jesus in the first century, then Hume's testimony in the 18th, that he has never seen a resurrection, is not the proper touchstone of the credibility of the claim. We have to adjudicate this in terms of the proper claimants, and those are the people who, at the time, made relevant claims. That's all. Adams summarizes the case in the following way. This is in a footnote on page 30 of the third edition. If, then, improbable or incredible facts require stronger evidence to support them, and you'll recall here, Sherlock, having said something similar, the weight of testimony may be increased and the proofs that support it multiplied infinitely and, consequently, whatever is not absolutely impossible may be thus proved. The force of testimony cannot indeed alter the nature of things, so if something is logically impossible, no testimony can change that. But it can make things improbable become probable. It can give, give credibility and even certainty to things that were before incredible. Remember what Sherlock says in the trial of the witnesses. I do allow that this case and others of like nature require more evidence to give them credit than ordinary cases do. You may therefore require more evidence in these than in other cases, but it is absurd to say that such cases admit no evidence when the things in question are manifestly objects of sense. So a very close tie there between Adams and Sherlock. I'm going to wind up with a quotation from a book by Charles Babbage, one of the founders of modern computer science, called The Ninth Bridgewater Treatise. The Bridgewater Treatises were uh, volumes written in natural theology, and eight of them had come out. Babbage had not been asked to write one. So, with a sense of humor, he entitled one of his own works The Ninth Bridgewater Treatise, even though it was not one of the Bridgewater Treatises. And he wrote what he thought was correct there. A significant portion of Babbage's critique is taken up in a mathematical exploration of probability theory as applied to Hume, and this is Babbage's conclusion. If independent witnesses can be found who speak truth more frequently than falsehood, it is always possible to assign a number of independent witnesses the improbability of the falsehood of whose concurring testimony shall be greater than the improbability of the alleged miracle. This is all emphasis in the original. What Babbage is saying is that under certain conditions, independence of witnesses who have what we should speak of today as a top-heavy Bayes factor, 
it is always possible to assign a number, enough of them, such that their coordinated testimony, the cumulative case created by the conjunction of their testimony, will overcome any antecedent degree of improbability you like. We can't change a probability of zero, that corresponding to things that are actually logically impossible, but we can raise any other probability as far as necessary, no matter how low you set it, I can name a number of witnesses of this kind sufficient to overcome that improbability. That is also the judgment of John Ehrman in his book, Hume's Abject Failure. So John is a philosopher of science and actually goes right through Babbage's proof, reconstructs it, and argues that Babbage was right and Hume was completely wrong, and in principle, there could be such testimony as to overcome any antecedent improbability. Um, Ehrman is not a Christian. He's an agnostic. He says he has no need of gods, but if he did, they would be the gods of the Greeks and the Romans. But he's trying to set the record straight because he thinks that Hume's critique, if we took it seriously, would also stop natural science. And for him, that is not a price anyone should be willing to pay. So we have to leave the door open to testimony to the miraculous. He's cynical about the prospects of such a case, but we must leave the door open to it in order not to slam the door on things that we should want to be able to come to know in the sciences. Or, in the words of the American logician Charles Sanders Peirce, do not block the path of inquiry. That concludes today's lecture.